Take your Bible and turn to Micah 6. Micah 6. We are almost through this minor prophet book of Micah. We will be in chapter 7 next week, and then we'll conclude the series. And then we're going to begin a verse-by-verse series through the book of Revelation two weeks from today. So if you have some friends that uh, don't know the Lord or friends that don't go to church, I encourage you to invite them, especially two weeks from today, as the kicking off of a new series is often a, a natural time to invite people. But today's message is entitled, The Courtroom of God, The Courtroom of God from Micah 6. And we come to what is probably the best known verse in all of Micah and possibly in all of the Old Testament. And it really is the clearest statement of what God requires from his people. Uh, If you want to know the kind of life that you should be leading, then you would look at Micah 6 and verse 8 and you would live by it. Let's look at that verse together. It says, He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly before your God. What a great verse, right? I, uh, I remember memorizing that verse as a wee lad at Hunter's Glen Baptist Church in Plano, Texas, and my parents took me to Bible drill, and in Bible drill, we learned Micah 6, 8. And I want to encourage you parents to lead your children to memorize this verse with you if you haven't memorized it yourself. But we're headed this morning into understanding not just Micah 6, 8, but really all of Micah 6. The best way to understand the significance of this very well-known verse is to look at what encompasses it uh, both before and after. And I do hope that you'll have your Bible in front of you. If you're not in the habit of bringing your Bible with you to church, I want to encourage you to start bringing it uh, or at the least bring it up on your phone. But uh, I, I like to have a physical Bible with me. But um, Micah 6.3, it, it helps us to understand verse 8 a little bit more. It says, Oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. So evidently, these people had come to a place where they felt that God had placed unreasonable burdens on their lives. And I guess we all have a time in our life that's like this, when we feel unreasonable burdens upon us. Something goes wrong for you or your family, and you say, well, what's God doing? He's allowing an intolerable burden on my life. Again, looking at verse 3, Oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. I just got to be honest with you with a moment of transparency. The fact that our church has a roof problem, and I've emailed the church about this several times. I've met with our operations team. I've met with our deacons. After church today, meeting with the Pulse team. I'm going to meet with the finance team. We're going to have a question and answer time a week from today at 5 p.m. about it. But just, I'm saying I'm jumping through a lot of hoops to make sure everybody's informed. And then we're going to have a quarterly business meeting uh, two weeks from today at 5 p.m. But saying all that stuff, it's just been a burden to me. And then all of a sudden in my time with the Lord, the Lord just told me just to let go of it. And his yoke is easy. His burden is light. He brought that verse to my mind. I want to encourage you, whatever is a burden on your shoulders, just to release that over to the Lord. Oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. Sometimes we feel that God's let us down. That's how it was in Micah's day. These believers weren't really happy with God. They were complaining. They were saying, God's let us down, and he's given us these great burdens God's made our lives difficult. God's not coming through for us. And so they were kind of in a season of being a whiny hiney. You ever been a whiny hiney before? Have your kids ever been like that? That means that you probably were too at some point. I'm not looking over at my wife because she knows that I would never complain. Right. She's writing this down, actually. I see her doing it right now. Uh, But God's people have made these charges, these accusations against him. And what happens in Micah 6, very simply, is that God counters by bringing a case against his own people. Now, if you 
Anybody in here like the dramas on TV, the courtroom dramas? Raise your hand if you're into that kind of stuff. Okay, like six people, whatever. Well, I like it, all right? And uh, I like seeing, uh, particularly the show Monk is my favorite show probably in the history of TV. Anybody like Monk? It's not on the air anymore. What a great show. But anyway, I love dramas and I like knowing who's going to be the prosecutor, who's going to be the judge, who's the defendant, all that kind of stuff. And as I was reading through Micah 6, by the way, the way that I, I will typically go into sermon preparation is I will just read through the text a whole bunch of times trying to understand it a little bit. And uh, I kept thinking about a courtroom drama when I was reading Micah 6. And so I thought that's how the Lord would have me present that to you today. Micah 6, 2, it says, Hear, you mountains, the indictment of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has an indictment against his people, and he will contend with Israel. So the Lord has a case against his people. And he's filed the docket there at the courthouse, apparently, and he's launching a charge against Israel. So now I want us to think through this court court case that runs through the chapter together. And if you're a lawyer in here today or, or a judge or anything like that, then just uh, bear with me as I try to follow through the justice system a little bit uh, as we follow this. But let's first look at the witnesses. Point number one, the witnesses. If you're going to bring a case, in this case, uh, God bring a case against Israel, you have to have witnesses, right? Every court case has witnesses, just about. And in this case, God is prosecuting against his own people. And he brings some very remarkable witnesses indeed. Look at verse 2 again. It says, Hear, you mountains, the indictment of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. So the point here is quite simple. God had hundreds of years before he made a covenant with his people. He cut a covenant. And when that happened, God spoke about the heavens and the earth being witnesses to that covenant. Now, if you're at a wedding and you hear about a covenant being cut between a man and a woman, you know that in that situation that there are witnesses who are present in the midst of that covenant being formed, right? We've witnessed that. The nodding of the head would mean yes. You with me? You got to talk back to the preacher. Come on, we, we're still getting to know each other five, six months in, but, but that's just part of it. So uh, God spoke about the heavens and the earth being witnesses to that covenant. And you find in many places in the Old Testament that being the case. One example is in the book of Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. This is what that verse says. It says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. So if you want to follow through where God lays out two ways for his people to live, there's a way that will lead to blessing and there's a way that will lead to a curse. There's a way that will lead to life. There's a way that will lead to death. And the idea here in Deuteronomy 30 and verse 19 is that as God speaks and as the people make their vows and their response back to him, that the heavens and the universe are witnesses. All right? This is very important for the understanding of Micah 6, particularly in verse 2, that the, the mountains, that the earth itself, they are witnesses before God in the midst of a covenant. All right? They heard these words, as it were, and God's promises to his people and his people's promise to God. And so now there is this case that God comes up with in, in, in regards to his people. The heavens and the earth stand as witnesses to the covenant. So who were the witnesses here in Micah 6? The mountains and the earth itself. All right? Um, God's covenant with his people, this ultimate covenant, of course, was made to continue from generation to generation. And because it continued from generation to generation, who could remain as the witnesses? It had to be something that was everlasting. So God calls the mountains, the heavens, the earth, uh, 
as witnesses to that covenant promise that he made with his people and that his people made back to him. Uh, Remember, of course, the covenant was cut at Mount Sinai. Uh, Exodus chapter 20, um, God came down to the mountain and there there was the point where people seemed to have uh, had God's sacred promises to his people and they were saying, we shall not break these, these promises, so on and so forth. So number one, the witnesses. And the witnesses were who? Uh, we've got the mountains, we've got the heavens, we've got the earth. So those are the witnesses. Secondly, let's look at the evidence. The evidence. There are two pieces of evidence I want us to look at. It comes in two different parts in this trial. One is that the Lord kept his covenant. The Lord kept his covenant. Look at verses 4 and 5. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery, and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O my people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, devised, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. Uh, God is reminding the people that going back generations... Their fathers and mothers were slaves, okay? If it had not been for the Lord, they would have been slaves as well. It's only by God's grace and him intervening in that miraculous way that the Israelites were freed from slavery. But God stepped in and he brought their parents out of it in Egypt and brought them into an entirely new position of blessing a position of prosperity because the Lord kept his covenant. I want us to remember something from a theological perspective of the ark of the Bible, particularly the ark of the Old Testament. When I say ark, I'm talking about A-R-C, not A-R-K from Genesis 6 through 9, okay? Just making that clear. So I'm talking about the story of the Old Testament, the exodus of the Old Testament, The Exodus was the definitive act of God in the Old Testament, okay? Uh, It changed everything for his people. So again and again and again, it points forward from the Exodus uh, and and the death and the, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus is tied to that which, by the way, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is the definitive act of the New Testament. Uh, And that changes everything for those who come to him. And if you've never received Jesus Christ, you come to Jesus and you say, Jesus, I want to ask you to forgive me of my sins. I want to receive you as my Lord and my Savior forever. And that is your act of coming to him and saying, I want to become a Christian. And I want to be released from the slavery to sin and the, the slavery of death and hell. And I want to be brought into an entirely new position in Christ. That's the definitive act of the New Testament. That's the definitive act of your life if you want to give your life to Christ today. But God says to his people, hey, I've kept my promise. I freed you from slavery. And furthermore, he's pointing forward to the fulfillment of the prophetic word of Micah 6 in Jesus Christ himself that we'll get to in a little bit when we will look at the book of Matthew a little bit later on in this message. But uh, it's good to remember that God's covenant is established by grace. It wasn't the slaves in Egypt who negotiated their release through God. Uh, How could they have done that? It was God that reached down from heaven and he just saved them. This is the kind of God he is. He is a gracious God. He is. So God kept his promise, but God's people, secondly, within this this point, God's people have broken their covenant promise to him. If you just look in Micah 6, verses 9 through 16, that's where God speaks specifically about the sins of the city. And in this, he's referring especially to sins that are rooted, are you with me? He's referring specifically to sins that are rooted in the business world. Those of you who are in the business world, who are thinking through sins that you see in corporate America, uh, 
I want you to pay close attention to this portion of the message and look at Micah 6, verses 9 through 10. And by the way, this is one of those points in the Bible where you read it, you say, what in the world does this, this mean? Then we dig into it together and we can apply it really practically to our lives. So this is the juicy part of the message, all right? Verse 9, the voice of the Lord cries to the city, and it is sound wisdom to fear your name. Hear of the rod and of him who appointed it. Can I forget any longer the treasure of wickedness in the house of the wicked and the scant measure that is accursed? So as he's talking, and by the way, that is the point of the message where I look at a couple of verses in the Bible and I'm like, what in the world does that mean? Okay, and I've told you before that I read the Bible sometimes and I'll say, what in the world does that mean? And you've told me before, yeah, I get that too. I read stuff in the Bible and I'm like, I don't get it. And that's okay, but you can dig deeper into it and you can eventually figure it out because God's word is illuminated, it says in Psalm 119, 105. Okay, that, that, that should encourage you for those of you who've tried to grow in your faith and you're like, I just get frustrated when I read the Bible because I don't understand it sometimes. But he will eventually clarify what he's saying. And as he's talking in verses 9 and 10, he brings out some evidence in this case about the way in, in which folks in the business community were making their money. And it was corrupt. And they were breaking their covenant with God. And some folks have become quite wealthy, but God had questions about the way they were making money. And this should come close to home for those of us who live right around the headquarters of Walmart and J.B. Hunt and Tyson and uh, all that stuff. Uh, but God gets a little specific here about the corruption and not in corporate America, but in corporate Israel. Okay, Look at verse 11. And those businessmen, businesswomen, I want you to circle verse 11 in your Bible of, of Micah 6. Shall I acquit the man with wicked scales and with a bag of deceitful weights? So let me explain this. In those days, this is the way that buying and selling would take place. They would have scales, Okay. And with those scales, there would be a bag of stones next to it, just in the marketplace. And so they would have one scale, and they would put a stone on there that would say one pound, two pounds, five pounds, whatever, or whatever was the measurement of that day. And then they would put barley or dill or cumin or whatever that it is that they were buying, they would put it on the other scale, and then when it evened out, they would realize, okay, I have whatever, two pounds of... Uh, of barley that I'm buying. Well, the corrupt business world of Israel, what they were doing is they were taking the stones and they were marking them two pounds, but in reality, it was one and a half pounds and they wrote two pounds on it. See what I'm saying? That's some shady business practice going on up in there. That wasn't as astute as I was taught in seminary to speak. It was not proper theologically to do this, okay? They were getting corrupt. And God was calling them out on their corruption. And he's saying, wait a minute. Shall I acquit the man with wicked scales and with a bag of deceitful weights? This was the sort of thing that was rife in the business world back then, which in different ways, it's prevalent in corporate America today and corporate Northwest Arkansas today. Out of the hundreds of people who go to Farmington first and call this church their home, there are many of you who go out into your lives in the business world, you're trying to make a living, you know that it's a jungle out there and you experience pressure every day of your life and it's intense pressure and you've got competition over contracts and therefore pressure is there to cut corners, to shade the truth, uh, 
and you're trying to match bids with unscrupulous contractors out there, I understand it. Large companies are out there building a position that will force out the small business, so on and so forth. And you're trying to think, how can I get an edge over the other person? Is this hitting home to anybody? Look at verse 12. Your rich men are full of violence. Your inhabitants speak lies, and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. Can I ask you, what, what is the deal with us having contracts for everything that are a mile long? Or is it just me who sees this? It's like you have to have a contract for everything, and it, is, it takes forever Just to open up a free Gmail account, if you actually read through everything that you say you're agreeing to on that thing, wow. Why do we have all these contracts? It's because there's a lack of integrity in the world. It's because there is sin in the world. So in this situation in Micah 6, the prosecution rests its case. By the way, typically we think of God in the courtroom as being the judge. In this situation, God is playing the role of prosecutor. So God, the prosecutor, rests his case in this situation right here after verse 12. And you might say, well, what about the defense? If you read through Micah 6 over and over, you'll realize there is no defense for these ungodly actions. So that then leads to this. What do you do if you're facing a court case And there's really no defense to be had. You plea bargain, right? That leads to point number three, which is the plea bargain. Because that's exactly what happens in verses six and seven. It's all about plea bargaining. And this is really significant. There is an awareness of guilt that is extant in verses six and seven. Let's look at those two verses. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? So notice here, that's a pretty extreme thing to say. Like, should I give my firstborn for my sin? There's an admission of guilt. Because at the end of verse 7, he's saying, he representing Israel, is saying, yeah, we've got sin in our soul. There's an acceptance of responsibility here. These words in verses 6 and 7 are really the words of someone who can hold up their hand before God and say, okay, God... You've got me, I surrender, I'm guilty, and I've not been straight with you, God. I've dodged, um, I've weaved, I've made my money in ungodly ways at times, and sometimes it's on my own conscience, and God, you've got me, and I'm guilty. Now, what do you want me to do about the way that I feel with this? And just look at verse 6 again. With what shall I come before the Lord? And bow, bow, and bow myself before God on high. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings and calves a year old? Isn't it interesting that when we feel guilty, there is often an impulse to become more religious? I'm going to say that again because I think this is really practical. Isn't it Amazing how when we feel guilty, we often become more religious. That's just kind of how it is. And a bad conscience will make a man religious. And so he's saying here in verse 6, burnt offerings. Shall I offer burnt offerings? Someone may say, well, I've, I've made a lot of money. I don't really feel at peace about the way that I've made a bunch of this money. So I'm going to give a portion of that money to the church. 
Uh, maybe I should do some work in the church. I should have some time volunteering. Next time uh, they ask for volunteers, which by the way, we need more uh, volunteers in children's ministry, youth ministry, uh, media ministry. Um, Houston Marillo, our, our brand new interim children's minister, was recruiting my wife to serve. My wife is about to start serving in the children's ministry because she was recruited yesterday. So if you're feeling guilty about some sin in your life, maybe you should say, you know, I'll step up and I'll just say, yes, we'll take you. All right. But that's, that's kind of the way that it was happening here in verses six and seven. The other thing that's kind of interesting here is the ascending scale in the plea bargain. Because he starts out, he referring to all of Israel, what can I do in the light that, that I feel so guilty? So it starts with a low bid about a few year old calves. You see that in verses six and seven? Well, a few year old calves, but that doesn't feel like enough. So how about a few thousand rams? but that doesn't feel like enough. So then you have just tons of oil. No, that doesn't feel like enough. And there's exasperation and a grandiose gesture of saying, how about my own kid? What if I just sacrifice my own kid? Or for us, it's like, I feel really guilty about the way that I've made my money. How about I sell my big fancy boat? Or how about I just give up my career and I, I become a missionary somewhere? Or maybe I should just start my life all over again. And I don't know, God, how do I deal with all this guilt for how I've made money in an ungodly manner? How do I settle this case? What is enough? What do you want from me? And if you've ever been there, you can understand the guilt that is experienced by the people of Israel here in Micah 6. And so this is how God responds to that kind of a perspective. He responds with verse 8. In verse 8, it says, he has told you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with your God. Oh, that is rich. That's powerful. See, what God's saying is, he's saying, here's what I want you to do. I want you to separate yourself from the sins of the city. And I don't want you to be living within those sins any longer. Not necessarily by coming out of the business world, but by doing business in a different way. A way that honors God, a way that's marked by justice and mercy and faithfulness or humility to your word. Of course, these verses apply to much more than just business, but it's important, I think, for us to see that that is actually the first context in which Micah 6 was written. Okay. Okay. If you lead a Bible study in your office, perhaps, Micah 6 would be a great passage to teach them in your, in your office if you're allowed to do that kind of thing. Uh, if you belong to Jesus Christ, your calling is to a life that is marked by justice, a calling, the, calling to a life that's marked with mercy, a life that's marked with faithfulness and humility. And God's not looking for you to be religious in response to your sin. Okay. In fact, putting a veneer of religion over an unchanged life just adds to your offense before God. It certainly won't impress other people. It certainly won't impress God. And there's, here's, here's a biblical example of this, a beautiful cross-reference to what Jesus has to say about Micah 6, 8 in the book of Matthew. In Matthew 23, if you want to flip over there, and just keep, keep your finger in, in Micah 6 and then just flip over to Matthew 23, verse 23. This is what it says. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and, then, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. So you see what he's saying. These folks, these Pharisees, they're very religious. I mean, it's almost unbelievable how religious they are. They have taken tithing to the nth degree. They don't just tithe money that they make. They... <laughs> 
They tithe their salt, their pepper, their dill, their cumin, their mint. I don't know about you. I have a garden and in my garden, which I'm like weirdly obsessed with my garden, by the way, because I've never done it before this season and I'm obsessed with this little tiny garden in my backyard, but I've got mint overflowing in it. If I was a Pharisee, I would tithe the first tenth of the mint grown in my garden over to God. That's what Jesus is saying in Matthew 23, 23. He's like, that is ridiculous. You moron. No, he doesn't say that. I shouldn't have said that. But he's saying that's ridiculous. I'll tell you a word that he would use is the word punctilious. And that's just a fun word to say. But... It's something where you are obsessed. The word punctilious is the best word to use for this. Where you are obsessed with doing something right that you become over the top about it. And you know the problem. He says to the Pharisees, for all that religious discipline in your life, you've completely ignored the weightier matters of the law. I mean, what's more important the weightier matters of the, than the weightier matters of the law? What are the things of substance which God is calling us to do? And he says there are three things. And he, you can tell that Jesus was referring to Micah 6, 8 when he talks about justice and mercy. And then he uses the word faithfulness where the prophet Micah uses uh, the word uh, humility in walking before the Lord. But Jesus says you should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. In other words, Jesus is saying, hey, don't worry about um, tithing to the, uh, the point where you're obsessed with it. I mean, we need to tithe, but we don't need to be obsessed with it because you want to know what really matters to God. And it's right here that you do justly, that you love mercy, that you walk humbly before your God. Jesus is saying in Matthew 23, 23, that your attitude toward God matters a whole lot to him. So we've got to do justice. That means you do right even when it's costly. That means that you love mercy. You don't just show mercy, but you love mercy. People who love mercy are always looking for another way to show it. That means that you walk humbly before your God. Walking humbly is showing that faithfulness. By the way, faithfulness it means that we keep doing godly things over a, a really long period of time. It means walking in a way that is steady and sustained and it's constant. So we've looked at the witnesses, we've looked at the evidence, we've looked at the plea bargain. You might say, well, as we wrap this up, what about the verdict? Well, that's the fourth and final point is the verdict. We've talked about a trial. We've seen the witnesses of evidence. We've seen the lack of defense, the plea bargaining. So what about the verdict? Well, you don't get a verdict in this chapter. You do in the next chapter. So you have to come back next Sunday to hear about it. But if you read through the end of Micah, which I encourage you to do, please read Micah 7 in your time with the Lord this week. Uh, and I see so many of you writing that down, which really encourages me. But God speaks, and I want you to hear me as we're wrapping up this message. God speaks about treading our sins underfoot and hurling all of our iniquities into the depths of the sea. That's what God does with our sin. He hurls it into the depths of the sea. He doesn't hold it over your head. He, he forgets our sin as far as the east is from the west once we come to him for forgiveness. Can I ask you something? Have you ever been in a situation where you did something wrong, you asked somebody for forgiveness and they said they forgave you, but they kept bringing it up and they kept holding it over your head over and over and over. You know what I'm talking about? The Bible says that God forgets that as far as the East is from the West. He releases you from your sin, which is a beautiful thing. But it sounds to me when it says in Micah 7 that uh, 
He's treading sins underfoot and hurling all our iniquities in, into the depths of the sea. That sounds like God is dropping all the charges to me. That sounds like God is throwing the case out of court. It sounds like God is embracing us and being reconciled to us in a wonderful way. And that's exactly what it is. But here's the point. Before we get to the forgiveness of Micah 7, we have to face up to the calling of Micah 6. Where we need to repent of our sins, receive the forgiveness of God today. Stand up with me right now, very quietly, very reverently. This is the time of the service that we call the invitation. And what I'm inviting you to do is in a moment after I pray to walk forward and just say, I want to receive Jesus Christ as my Savior. I'm inviting you to walk forward and say, you know, I, I have received Jesus Christ, but I want to grow more deeply in my faith than I have. And I, I just feel... I feel burdened to share that. I invite you to walk forward here in just a moment. Pray for your business. Pray for your career. Pray for your job. That you would have a career of integrity before the Lord. As Micah 6 refers to that very clearly. Pray for your coworkers. I want to invite you to consider coming forward and begin the praying process of joining our church family. We'll eventually get you in our new members class and teach you about our church and what it means and what our doctrine is, that kind of thing. I invite you to come forward and say, I have received Christ, but I've never been baptized. I need to get baptized. We'll talk with you about that. I invite you to come forward and, and pray with somebody or pray by yourself at the altar, but you need to pray for something or someone in your life. I encourage you to come. So I'm about to pray. When I close the prayer, you walk forward and you receive that invitation. Let's go to the Lord. Lord Jesus, please help us Help us to respond to this message in accordance with your will. Lord, we come before you asking you to forgive us of our sins, to be our Savior and Lord. For those of us in our businesses, that we would be above reproach. So Lord, we pray for all these things and all these people in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.